So hopefully you're all ready and we can make a start. So approaching CSI and passing first time is the theme. Um, in terms of putting this in context to start with, so context and structure, uh, the idea here is obviously that CISI exams are increasingly being used internationally. I, I think most of you are from the UAE, where they are very much in place and an expectation, a benchmark competence test utilised by the regulator by the Securities and Commodities Authority in the UAE. Um, so these exams are increasingly being used for that. Um, and what I'm going to do here is show you how to go about passing these things. Um, and I, in particular, will be drawing on something we call the International Introduction to Securities and Investment, or just the International Intro to do this. Now, that doesn't mean if you're sitting something different to that, this won't help because it very much will. Uh, the, the tips and techniques that I'm gonna run through here will be equally applicable to any other CIS, CISI examination, whether it's um, the international intro, or the international certificate in wealth and investment management, uh, UAE financial rules and regulations, what, what, whatever it may be, uh, the tips and techniques that I'm gonna share with you will be useful for preparing yourselves for any of those qualifications. Now, uh, I've put at the bottom here a word of warning. I'll just get my laser pointer out here. So down the bottom here, I've put words of warning. You can see down the bottom here. Uh, and I'm saying, look, what I'm gonna give you here is my own views. Um, so you're gonna get my personal views. Now this is being recorded, so I've got to be a little bit careful about uh, what I say and uh, what I don't say, um, and hopefully I won't be saying anything inappropriate anyway, uh, but the, the views I'm putting forward are my own. Yeah. Um, now, uh, however, having said that, um, I am obviously uh, an important input into some of the products that we at the CCL Academy produce to support people and to enable people to prepare for these exams. Um, and something that some of you actually on this call may be using are, are, are our distance learning products. So we, we've tried to distill what we believe is an appropriate approach into our distance learning product. And, and I will make mention of that on the way through, and hopefully that will be helpful, illustrative, uh, and everything else. It will also rationalize what we're trying to do in that product. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're using that or not, the tips and techniques will still be valid, but I will make mention to the, uh, of, of our distance learning product from time to time. So that's a bit about context and structure. And let's begin to talk about my credentials um, and the CCL Academy credentials uh, in terms of giving you these te tips, techniques, and um, products to support your learning efforts and everything else. Uh, well, me personally, you, you can see I don't have much hair left. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty ancient guy. Um, I'm, I'm a professional trainer. Uh, I train in the world of finance, and I've been doing so for a, a long time. Um, I trained uh, CISI examinations for comfortably these days more than 25 years, uh, which is a quarter of a century, which is a stunning length of time really, isn't it? Um, uh, and uh, is this the right thing to dedicate most of my life to? I, I don't know, but I've done it. Um, so I, I, I feel proud enough to shout about it perhaps, uh, which is possibly misguided, but I do. Um, uh, as well as being a professional trainer, I also author um, a, a number of, for example, workbooks um, that the CISI writes to support its qualifications and various other bits and pieces. And I design e-learning, distance learning, a variety of different products. So uh, I uh, get involved in lots and lots of training assets, if you like, support tools and, and everything else. And I, I've got a lot of experience uh, and hopefully I can distill some of that into what I'm talking to you about today. Now, 
the firm that I'm proud to represent is the CCL Academy. And uh, myself and my colleagues are, 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 are mightily proud that the CCL Academy is one of the few training organizations uh, around the globe that has been awarded uh, what they call the premier training partner badge uh, by the CISI. So uh, this is where in, in essence, the CISI kind of takes a sly rule over us and, and assesses what we do and how we do it. Uh, and essentially, if they like what they see, uh, and I mean really like what they see and they believe in the professionalism that we bring to the whole thing, then they give us this premier training partner badge uh, and we need to go through a reappraisal on that on an annual basis. And we're proud to have that badge. And there you can see it in front of you on the slide. So that's a bit about my credentials and the firm that I am proud to represent, the firm's credentials at CCL Academy. Um, moving onwards, if you are preparing to sit a CSI qualification, um, if you are a, a, a training manager getting a group of delegates together to think about a CISI uh, examination and prepare them for it, um, if you are a team leader getting your team together and getting them sorted in terms of uh, preparing themselves for these kind of examinations, you have to appreciate the, the interaction between three things. Yeah? And those three things, as you can see on the slide behind me, is number one, the syllabus, number two, the workbook, number three, the exam. And what I'm gonna to explain to you is the way the CISI uses these three things to, if you like, produce an examination in the first place. Uh, and an appreciation of that is absolutely imperative to enable you to prepare yourself in a logical and reasoned manner. And I'll be drilling down into each of these things as we go through uh, this presentation and as I reinforce what you should be doing, my tips, the techniques that you should be adopting. So here you've got the three. So imagine the CISI is coming up with perhaps a brand new examination for a particular regulator somewhere. The first thing they do is they prepare a syllabus. Yeah? Now the syllabus is created by an employee at the CISI, and that employee is the examiner or the exam manager. Yeah? Uh, and that CISI employee will gather together a panel of external experts that are actually involved in the world in which the exam is aimed. In other words, if it's an exam that relates to I know, investments and securities, they will be involved in the area of wealth management, client advice and, and, and what have you. Yeah. So the idea is the examiner alongside these experts pull together what is examinable. They design, if you like, a syllabus on which the exam will be based. And this syllabus is ultimately made up of a whole series of what they call learning objectives. So the learning objectives make up the syllabus. Now these learning objectives are subdivided into individual elements. We'll see more on that in a minute, but ultimately it's a series of learning objectives. And the learning objectives say, these are the things, for example, you should know. These are the things you should understand. These are the things you should be able to calculate. Yeah. These things are learning objectives, and that is detailed in the exam syllabus. Yeah. Now, once the syllabus is pulled together, what the CISI then does is says, well, right, we need to prepare a companion workbook to go with this syllabus. And they commission an author to write a workbook. And this is some of the authoring that I do, for example. I author workbooks, certain workbooks for the CISI. So they commission an author to write a workbook. And the workbook is obviously a reflection of the syllabus. It's clearly based on the syllabus. It tends to be structured in the same way, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, and clearly it covers all of the learning objectives that are in the syllabus. Otherwise, it's not doing its job. 
So the workbook is commissioned by the CISI, is written by an author, and the author is not the same as the panel that's gathered together, or is not the same, is not a panel member that's gathered together. This syllabus in the first place tends to be someone separate, uh, a workbook author, a suitable author, uh, and they pull together this workbook. The workbook used to be called official workbooks. They don't use that terminology anymore. But, but you know, this is the key document, the workbook. Yeah? If you know what's in the workbook, you'll pass the exam, or you're certainly more likely to pass the exam at the first time of asking than if you don't know what's in the workbook. The workbook is clearly important, and I'll reinforce that as we continue. Now, once the workbook is written, then the CISI then goes out and commissions exam questions to be written. Now the exam questions are a reflection of two things, the learning objectives and what is in the workbook. And you can see that what's happening here is the people that write the exam questions, the resource they're given and what they're told to do is write exam questions that are compatible with things that are covered in the workbook. So frankly, there is very little point doing anything in terms of studying that goes outside of the workbook. Why? Because the workbook sets the boundary of what they're going to examine. Every question has to be answerable from the workbook. Yeah? If it's not, it's not in the exam. <coughs> Excuse me. If it's not, it's not in the exam. So the workbook is absolutely key. It sets the boundaries. If you know what's in there, you know what's examinable. What's outside of the workbook is not examinable. Not gonna crop up in exam questions. And what you need to worry about is the exam and passing it. So you only need to worry about the workbook. So that's the big picture. The, the one thing that I haven't said there really is this typically requires 70% to pass at the bottom here. You, you know and I know that uh, if you are preparing for a, a CISI multiple choice question, the typical requirement is you've got to get at least 70% of the questions right in order to earn a pass. And I'll reinforce that as we go through. So that's typically the pass percentage that is required for success. So that's the interaction of the syllabus, the workbook, and the exam. Now, moving onwards, drilling down into a bit more detail about each of these things. So, as I say, it's absolutely vital that you appreciate the interaction of these things and that you utilise, in particular, the syllabus and the workbook in order to prepare yourself for the examination. So here, here's an example. Um, this is the international intro, the international introduction to securities and investment. Um, it's uh, an exam that many of you uh, are presumably familiar, or at least you know it exists. Um, it's made up, its syllabus is made up of nine, they call them elements in the syllabus. There they are. I don't think I need to go into them in any detail at all. That's not the purpose of this. Um, but you can see the first one is about the financial services sector, and then we've got the economic environment, various other things, including derivatives and investment funds and bonds and, and, and what have you. So there are nine elements that make up the syllabus. That is not the total syllabus you see there. That's just the elements and a brief explanation of what each of them are about. Now, within each element, there are obviously a series of learning objectives, uh, and I will show you those learning objectives in, in, a, in, a, in a few moments. So the syllabus made up of elements, and for the international intro, there are nine of them. For the International Certificate in Wealth Investment Management, there are only eight, yeah? um, different numbers for different qualifications and different syllabuses, syllabi, perhaps the plural there. So that's a little bit about the international intro and the way the syllabus breaks down. Now here it is again, represented in a slightly different way. You can see a table in front of you. Uh, the left-hand column uh, specifies the elements. 
so you've got nine elements in the international intro. This is the international introduction to security investment exam specification. Uh, so there are nine elements. These elements also represent the chapters in the workbook. So the workbook always does each element as a separate chapter. So the workbook for the international intro is made up of nine chapters because the syllabus is made up of nine elements. The workbook for the International Certificate in Wealth and Investment Management is made up of eight chapters because there are eight elements in the syllabus. So here are those nine elements. And what the examiner rather helpfully does for us, as well as detailing the number of learning objectives, the examiner also tells us the exam significance of each element. So we can see there in that third column, number of questions, so on here, number of questions, the third column. We can see at the bottom here, the total number of questions is 50. There are 50 questions in this particular examination. Some other examinations have 100 questions. There are 50 in this one. Uh, and obviously you need to get 35 of them right to pass. 70% of them, if you like, 35 of that 50 right to pass. If you get more than 35, you passed. If you get less than 35, it's a problem because you failed. It's a pass fail. Now, in terms of where those questions are drawn from, the examiner tells us we can expect nine questions look, to be drawn from element four, which is equities or stocks. We can expect seven questions to be drawn from chapter seven, uh, element seven, which is investment funds, six from regulation ethics, et cetera, et cetera. So we know we can see that some elements some chapters in the workbook are more important than others. And the temptation is to say, well, that means we should put more effort into those in order to know what's necessary. And that's right. Yeah? Uh, but you will naturally do that when you start working your way through the workbook anyway. Yeah? Now, on the right here, I've added the number of learning objectives. Uh, and you can see there are four learning objectives for element one of the syllabus. Uh, three of those will be tested. Yeah. Which three? We don't know. Uh, there are five in the second element. Three of those five will be tested. Uh, nine, 15, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see there are a total of 79 learning objectives of which 50 will be tested in an exam. Uh, and what the CISI endeavors to do, I must admit they've slipped up on this here and there, but what they endeavor to do is to make sure any single learning objective is not tested more than once in an exam. Now that is absolutely important for you to appreciate. That means something, a learning objective can only be tested once. So if there's a learning objective in the syllabus that you categorically hate and can't get your head around, you can to an extent ignore it, can't you? Because for this exam, you know 49 of the learning objectives that will be tested or that might be tested, you will know something about. But there's one that might be tested, it might not even be tested, that you can't get your head around. Don't worry about it. If there's only one, don't worry about it. Yeah. Concentrate your efforts on everything else. One little learning objective that you can't get your head around is not going to make the difference between passing and failing. You only need to get 35 right. You do not need to get 50 right. And yeah, it may make you feel proud if you get 50 right. It also may, you, may make you look like someone who's just done too much work, spent too much time studying, done too much. Yeah overdone it, overcooked it, overegged it. Yeah. You want to pass. Yeah. That's the key. You don't want, most of you don't want, to get 100%. Maybe you do, but there's no need. So that's a bit about learning objectives, questions, the syllabus, the elements. Yeah. And that's the exam specification, so-called. Very, very useful, very important to appreciate. Now, in terms of this, sorry, in terms of this exam specification and the learning objectives that make up the syllabus, 
here what I've done is I've extracted three individual learning objectives from the international intro. Um, so you can see the three of them. What two of them come from the first element, the first chapter. One of them comes from the ninth element, the final chapter. So you can see 1.1.1 on the left there. Here's my laser pointer again. 1.1.1 there um, says, know the role of the following. So it's a no learning objective. It's expecting you to know something. Know the role of the following within the financial services industry. And then it's got a whole list. Yeah. And then 1.1.4 over here on the right, different learning objective know about the following emerging themes, yeah? FinTech ESG, yeah? It's a relatively new one, that one, yeah? And some of you might have done this exam before, perhaps didn't see that one, because that probably wasn't there when you did the exam. It's relatively new. What well, is a new learning objective in the latest version of the international intro? And then there's 9.2.3 here. And this is just illustrating that some of these learning objectives, instead of asking you to know things, they ask you to be able to calculate things. And this is being able to calculate the effective annual rate of borrowing given a quoted interest rate and a frequency. Uh, suffice to say that if you've ever studied this, you might hate that one. <laughs> you, you, you might love it. I, I don't know, different people strike them in different ways. Um, but that, that one is, certainly the most challenging learning objective uh, in the international intro. Um, it's a calculation, you can do it or you can, but it does involve some quite nasty mathematics for many people who haven't studied much maths before perhaps, um, so people can get frightened by that one. But ignore that one for the moment and concentrate on the other two. Yeah? And you consider for a second, which one of those, if any, do you think is a better learning objective? And which do you think is a worse learning objective? Uh, kind of from your perspective, I suppose, in terms of setting the boundaries and that kind of thing, which one do you think is better? Which one do you think is worse? 1.1.1 or 1.1.4? Now, don't, don't we, I'm not polling this or anything. I just want you to think along those lines. Which one do you think is better? Which one do you think is worse between those two? Now, as far as I'm concerned, and remember I have to train this and I have to prepare people for this, I vastly prefer this one, yeah, 1.1.1, than that one, 1.1.4. Why is that? Well, because this is actually really quite useful. It really tells me potentially the delegates, what they have to know. Yeah? It's really clear what is included and what's not in that learning objective. So I think this is better as a learning objective than this. This one on the right here, this 1.1.4, uh, know about the following emerging themes. What does that mean? Know about? What have we got to know about FinTech? I've got to, have I got to know why a, why a card was a fintech company that collapsed last year and it was a constituent of, uh, of the Deutsche uh, DAX index? Well, uh, what I've got to know, thankfully, is detailed in the workbook. So that learning objective is really actually quite bad. And without the help of the workbook, it would be bordering on the useless and unhelpful for someone trying to prepare themselves for this exam. Because it's too broad, it's not setting the boundaries sufficiently well. Uh, without the workbook, it would be a complete disaster. Without the workbook, you could say this one over here would be more demanding, but not as bad as 1.1.4. So I prefer 1.1.1 to 1.1.4, but I don't think either of them are perfect. And without the workbook, they present as many problems as they present solutions. So I, I'm not convinced they're perfectly drafted, but it's very, very difficult to perfectly draft these things without writing essays about them. I suppose 1.1.1 does border on the essay length, doesn't it? It does get pretty big. Um, uh, but these learning objectives are very important, very, very important, interpreted in the workbook, which is underlining, again, the workbook is setting the boundaries, underlining the importance of that workbook. 
Okay. Now, moving our attention on to the workbook, I've linked that relatively neatly. Um, uh, here is I've got a, a bit of a picture from the cover of the, the intro workbook there, which has got this lovely starburst colour thing going on, um, which makes you think, oh, this is a glossy workbook, and then you get inside it and there's no more colour. Uh, which is slightly disappointing, but there we are. It's a cost thing, isn't it, I suspect. Um, the key thing about the workbook, the key start point, is clearly this is a key resource to you, a vital resource for you. Check the validity. Yeah. What I'm saying here, this one is valid until you can see it there, 9th of September 2021. So this is the current version of the workbook. If the validity date is before that and you're studying from it, well, frankly, uh, you've got a problem. If it's before now and you're studying from it, you've got a problem. Yeah? You only want to study from the up-to-date valid workbook. An out-of-date workbook is dangerous yeah? uh, because it's not going to encompass new things like that FinTech and ESG learning objective we just saw a moment ago. Now, the workbook is important, but unfortunately, the workbook is quite big. Um, this particular workbook is around 200 pages long. Yeah. The International Certificate for Wealth Investment Management, uh, upwards of 300, 350 pages long about. Um, uh, the chapters are, are the elements. I've told you that already. The elements and the chapters uh, meet, meet each other. And chapter one covers element one of the syllabus. Remember, that had four learning objectives. And remember, those four learning objectives led to three exam questions. Well, of the 16 pages in the workbook, the first page doesn't mention any learning objective, just kind of context. The next five pages cover learning objective 1.1.2, and that's flagged uh, within the workbook. Then the next seven pages cover learning objective 1.1.1. Then the next two cover 1.1.3, and the final page covers 1.1.4. So you can see that some learning objectives have got more supporting detail to them than others but they are all reflected and flagged in the workbook. Don't worry too much about the learning objectives. Worry about knowing, understanding, appreciating, sometimes being able to calculate what's in the workbook. That's your start point. We'll refine our use of learning objectives at the revision stage later on, as you'll see as we go through this presentation. So that's a bit about the workbook for the international intro. Um, the recommended approach. Now, this is the way you or your charges, however it's working, depending on your role in the firms. Um, uh, this is about how you, how I recommend you go about studying this stuff. 200 pages of workbook is a lot. It's technical details for many of you. It might be in a second language. Yeah. Um, it's demanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to make it digestible. Yeah, you've got to make it, uh, you've got to break it down into small enough units that you can cope with each unit in isolation and then gradually build that up to a whole. Now, we reflect this in the way our distance learning works, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, but the, the obvious way to break it into digestible chunks is to look at each chapter, and a chapter is an element of the syllabus, look at each in isolation and concentrate on the individual chapters. Ignore the exam weighting, the exam significance for the moment, and say, look, chapter one is the one I'm going to deal with first, and only when I'm happy with that am I going to move on and deal with chapter two? And only when I'm happy with that do I move on and deal with chapter three, four, five, six, uh, all the way through the syllabus, nine chapters for the international intro, eight for the Certificate of Wealth and Investment Management. Um, so the idea is you break it down into chunks, make it achievable. Yeah, you don't run the marathon on the first day, you train towards it, you build up your capability. And this is the same context yeah if you're dealing with you know um, a, a big meal you break it into small portions and perhaps have a bit of a rest in between to get through it all yeah comfortably yeah so it's that kind of idea chunk it into smaller digestible units 
Yeah. Now, the way we do this in the distance learning is the way I'd recommend anyone to do this. The logical chunks are the chapters. Yeah. Do the chapters in isolation. And once you've done the chapters, build through and then consolidate your knowledge at the end. And that's what the distance learning does. Chapter one first. And what we do in the distance learning is we give you a, a, a lovely overview. I hope it's lovely. It's a video overview of the chapter first. So put it all in context for you. Then you go off and read the workbook. Make sure you know what's in the workbook. It's much easier when you've, when you've viewed the video. Uh, and then you test yourself a bit. You make sure you have got all that in your head before you move on. And that's vital because sometimes the chapters build on each other. You know, some of the later chapters rely on some of the things that come earlier for the context and for the learning objectives. So you need to build this stuff up. Yeah. And we try and build that in to our distance learning. Uh, the final point here, for some of you, some of you might work for big organizations. I think that is the case for a number of you working for big banks. Now, if the opportunity exists, in other words, if you've got colleagues studying for this at the same time, for goodness sake, reach out and talk to them. Yeah. Talk to each other, form a little study group, study cohort, talk to each other. It is so, so powerful. Yeah. Oh, I didn't quite get the grips of this. What are they getting at here? What's that all about? You know, if you try and articulate this between yourselves, you really use a different way of learning. It really does stretch you and make you think. Uh, I've never understood these things as well as I do because I have to teach these things. You know, if you know you're going to stand up and you're going to talk to others about these things, it really forces you to get your act together. And the same is true if you work in groups. You say, look, next week, let's talk about chapter one. If you do that, all of you have got to read chapter one by next week. It's a bit like a book reading group or whatever. This is really useful. Sharing views, articulating views, testing each other. Really, really helpful. If you've got that opportunity, take it. Use it. It will help. OK, so let's presume you've gone through this workbook chunk by chunk you've done individual chapters in isolation you've now got to the end and what you're going to think about is how am i going to get myself ready now to deal with all of these things at the same time how do i consolidate my knowledge how do i revise my knowledge how do i test myself get myself ready for the exam that's to come now it's important to appreciate here there is no such thing as past exam papers the csi CISI does not release past exams. Yeah? So the question bank is kept secret. Yeah? What's on that question bank, you only get to see when you do an exam. And if any of you have done these exams before, you know you don't take anything out with you. Yeah? You can photograph the exam questions with your uh, smartphone or whatever in there because you can't take your smartphone in. Yeah? It's like airport security. Yeah? So there's no such thing as past papers at all. Yeah? There are, however, loads of questions out there. And personally, I've written thousands of these things over the years. Uh, and these questions have been generated by people that are often trainers or commissioned by trainers or commissioned by the CISI uh, that have written these things. Uh, and these things may be in the public domain. Yeah. Some are inspired by real experience in the exam. Some are simply inspired by the learning objective. Some of them are, are frankly, rubbish. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm guilty, too. You know, I've written some rubbish questions in my time. I'm a lot better at writing them now than I ever was. Um, and you do get better with time. Um, but, uh, you know, to an extent, uh, even a poor quality question can be a helpful learning experience. And I'll, I'll come back to that in, in a, a few moments. Um, there is one set of questions that people think this is going to be useful. And why do they think this is going to be useful? Well, because the CISI publish it. Uh, and that's the practice exam, which is in the back of every workbook. So in every workbook, you've got a practice exam. It's obviously sitting there in the workbook. Uh, it will be 
think they do it for all of them now, it will be exactly the same size as the real exam. So, you know, if it's 50 question real exam, it'll be a 50 question practice exam. If it's a 100 question real exam, it'll be a 100 question practice exam in the workbook. Um, uh, and the workbook is giving you an example to practice on. Now people think, oh, that's gonna be really good. That's gonna be really useful. Please, it, it could be, but please be aware, it is not a real exam. It is not even written by the people that write the real exam questions. It is just someone's interpretation of the kind of questions that could be included in the real exam. It's not unlike what I've talked about here, these questions generated by uh, aspiring existing trainers and people that think they can teach you these things. Um, so by no means is the practice exam in the workbook perfect. It won't do you any harm, but it is not please don't think, well, this is going to be just like the real thing. It isn't. I've come across so many delegates in my life who say it was nothing like the one they put in the work. It won't be anything like the one they put in the workbook. The real exam will be a different experience. I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Yeah? But it's not from the examiner. That's the key point you've got to appreciate. It won't do you any harm to do it, but it's not from the examiner. Now, just banging our own drum a bit about our distance learning. Um, uh, numbers of questions can be important. I'll, I'll underscore that on the next slide. But our distance learning for the intro has got 340 questions in it in total. Uh, there are 10 questions at the end of every chapter. There are another 250 uh, in the revision section of the, the distance learning offering. 340 questions, that's a lot of questions. That's useful. Is that enough? Is that enough? Uh, and how do you deal with those questions? Well, that's what we're going to look at now. Are there ever enough? I'm so used to students saying to me, Martin, Martin, got any more questions? I've used all those ones you gave me. I don't keep questions hidden. I, I don't, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm trying to train someone towards an exam, I, I don't say, oh, I'll just give you some of my questions. I'll keep the other ones behind just in case. Yeah? I tend to share as much as I can. I'm trying to help people get through these things. Yeah? So we as an organization try and give away uh, all of the valid questions that we can uh, in the context of our product lines. So our distance learning, 340 questions, uh, if we had some more, we'd give them to you. We'd add to that. Yeah? And we will add to that, I'm sure, as we generate more questions. Uh, delegates always say it's never enough. Yeah, they always say, please, sir, can I have some more? And that's what this empty bowl is supposed to represent down here. Yeah, a bit like Oliver Twist. Please, sir, can I have some more? Um, uh, and we try and give you, we try and fill that bowl to overflowing, give you plenty of those things. What is absolutely vital for all of you is to use those questions in the right way. And so many questions, so many delegates do not use those questions in the right way. So many delegates think, well, those questions, I could find that same question in the real exam. You won't. You won't. I will be so surprised if you saw a carbon copy of a question you'd done before in the real exam. Why? Well, I've told you already, past papers aren't released. Those real exam questions are not in the public domain. All the questions you're seeing are kind of constructed in a way that hopefully replicates the real exam, but will not be perfect. Yeah? So you've got to appreciate that from the outset. Learning questions is not going to help you. You've got to know what is the right answer. And crucially, crucially, you've got to know why that is right and the others are wrong. And so many delegates look at questions and they just try and learn, oh, that's the right answer to that one. It's not gonna help you. Yeah. You've gotta know why it's the right answer and you've gotta know what's wrong with the other three because you're not gonna see the same question in the real exam. Yeah. So that, the third bullet point here, you need to know those two things. You need to know what of the four options is the correct one and you need to know why it's correct. And that involves you knowing why the other three are wrong, why they're incorrect. If when you're doing a question, you cannot appreciate that, 
then for goodness sake, it's part of the learning. It's a key part of the learning that you investigate and get to the bottom of that. And that might involve you going back to the workbook. It might involve you reaching out to your training organization. It might involve you sending a question to the likes of me to respond and tell you what's wrong with that particular option and why that the other option is the, the better answer. Yeah, but always, always do that. If you don't do that, you are missing an absolutely critical step. Yeah. Now, on paper, if you have a printed out version of the workbook or whatever, you've got that practice exam in there, 50 questions Yeah, for the international intro, 100 questions for the uh, certificate in wealth investment management. The huge temptation is for you to dive in and start doing that with a pen in your hand. Question one, all, C. Question two, all, B. Question C, all, D. And then when you've gone through the, the, the exam, the total number of questions, you mark them and you go through them and you say, oh, well, I put A for that. Oh, that was wrong. It should have been C. Yeah. As soon as you've started doing that, you have messed up your ability to use those questions ever again because they're covered in your scribbles. Yeah? Try and keep, if you're using paper at all, keep it clean. And this is one of the benefits of digital stuff that you, you can't scribble all over these things, so you can't mess them up. They are kept clean. Now, when you do more than one go at the same question, it does get easier and multiple attempts are not ideal. And that's why we try and give you lots of questions to practice on, so there's some freshness about them but use them sparingly, be a bit careful with them. Yeah, um, Only test yourself when you feel the time is right to do that. So if you're going through a chapter, for example, you've got to the end of the chapter using our distance learning product, which is ideal, um, and you wanna test yourself on the 10 questions that come at the end of each chapter. Yeah, Well, only do those when you feel you've embedded the knowledge already, when you've done enough to feel comfortable with the chapter, have a go, uh, and that makes it a more realistic test of your capability. Uh, and then, as I've said to you so many times already, check, that your understanding is right. If you're in doubt, solidify the knowledge so that that doubt is removed. Yeah, I call it this virtuous circle of learning. Yeah, go back and check, make sure you're improving all the time. Absolutely imperative. Yeah. Um, now, we, we structure our distance learning to culminate in, a, uh, in what we believe is our most realistic sort of mock practice exam, you know. So, so on the international introduction, we've got five practice papers there in our revision section. You know, you, you should only do the fifth one, for example, when you really feel that you're ready and your real exam is rapidly approaching and maybe it's in a few days time uh, and you just want to have this last chance to give yourself some confidence uh, and make sure you understand things. And that's when you should be working through that. I'm not suggesting you don't learn from it, but that's when you should be working through that. Okay, um, nearly there. Um, other useful activities here. Uh, I'll come to the Q&A in a second. I think someone submitted a question. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, other useful activities. Uh, the other things that you can do over and above doing questions, it may sound strange, but read the syllabus, actively read the syllabus. Look at the syllabus and say to yourself, do I know what they want me to know? Do I understand what they want me to understand? Am I able to calculate what they want me to calculate? It will create this virtuous circle for you to test yourself and go back and chase up where you lack. Same is true of the glossary. They've got a glossary in each workbook. Read, it's a bit like reading a dictionary, which sounds incredibly sad, but reading a glossary can be very useful to highlight those technical terms and those initials, those acronyms, you know, what those things stand for, what's the significance of them. Yeah. Build yourself little mind maps, take notes. I'll show you the mind maps that we've got within our International Certificate for Wealth and Investment Management distance learning. Uh, I'll show you one of those in a second to illustrate what I mean by that. And always use this virtuous circle, keep yourself fully 
match fit, if you like, do the exercises that you can, uh, do useful things. Here is a mind map. This, this comes from element six of the Equim, the International Certificate in Wealth Investment Management. It's a big chapter. It's pretty hideous. It's pretty demanding. Uh, and what, what we've done here, um, uh, and these are in our distance learning products, so we might be familiar with this. Um, but what we're showing you here is, is there are 15 questions drawn from this particular chapter, this particular element. Uh, it's made up of seven sub-elements, sub and there are the seven. Uh, and there are some key points for you to look at and consider. Do you know what that is about? GDP is uh, consumption expenditure plus investment expenditure, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, do you know about uh, return on capital employed? Uh, do you know about the acid test ratio? All those various things. It provides you with a, a really nice little checklist, I think. And you could build that kind of thing yourself, or you could utilize what perhaps others are providing to you. Yeah? Uh, and that's to say what we call our mind maps uh, drawn from one of our distance learning products for the International Certificate in Wealth and Investment Management. Okay. The exam, uh, people say, oh, the exam is so different to all the questions I did before. It's not true. I do the exams all the time. Yeah, I do the exams every time I'm allowed to do them. I go in there and I do the exams very much from the perspective of is this exam a fair exam? Does it cover what I teach? Does it cover what we've got in our products, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. I know the exam is very similar to the questions that you encounter before. Uh, not the same, not identical. It will never be identical. I've told you that already. It won't be identical, but it's not materially different. If you've done the work, you'll pass most, if not all, of the exams that I've ever done, some of the earlier ones, slight debate, but you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, so I'm bear that in mind. Um, but uh, however, having said that, I mean, people do feel differently. When you go into an exam room and you feel the pressure of that, it does feel different. Uh, the whole environment is different. You're doing something in the comfort of your own home office or whatever. Um, uh, and what you've got to do when you're doing this exam is do not get bogged down by any one question or any small number of questions. Remember what I said earlier, you've got to get 70% of them right. There is no negative marking in these exams at all. So if you get it wrong, you just don't get a mark. It's not like you get minus marks. So have a go at everything. You can afford 30% of them to be wrong. If something uh, is, is something you're not comfortable with, you're unsure about, just guess and move on. Best guess, move on. Best guess, move on. Yeah, hopefully there aren't too many like that, but that's the way to deal with these things. Be methodical, make sure you get through it. And then once you've got through it, if you've got time, go back and look at the ones you've probably flagged because you've got a few doubts about them. Yeah. So best guessing is the way to deal with things. Never get bogged down. If you get bogged down, it can be terminal in terms of your ability to pass. Please also bear in mind I, I shouldn't say this, perhaps, but I've been doing this for a long time. And I tell you, I go in to do, to do exams. And sometimes I find some of the exam questions are a bit imprecise. And if you overthink them, you might decide uh, another answer is more right than the one you initially thought was the right answer. And you might change your view and what have you. You know, you do. If you spend too much time thinking, you will often move your response. And my advice is probably to stick to your first instincts unless you really strongly believe that you know you made a mistake then yeah so try and be relatively confident yeah um don't doubt yourself too much uh most delegates tend to feel doubt uh and they might feel doubt about whether they've achieved a pass of the whole thing uh but i tell you when they walk out of it the majority of you will pass these things if You've done the work. If you haven't done the work, well, frankly, you shouldn't be passing. And, and the work demands are quite hefty. Never measure them in time. Uh, measure them in achieving things, achieving outcomes, 
Uh, and again, that's what we try and do in our products and our advice to you, you know, do chapter one, check, you know, chapter one before you move on to chapter two. So be productive. Um, but the examiners do say, you know, these exams take a certain amount of learning time. Uh, I think for international intro, they talk about 80 hours or something. Yeah, it's a lot of time, but those 80 hours are going to be productive, too. So I hope that gives you what you wanted. If it didn't, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, you might feel like you wasted your time. I'm sorry. Um, but I hope it was useful. I hope it was instructive. Um, uh, questions um, uh, from the floor. So uh, I think you've got the ability uh, to chuck in a question. I've got uh, questions here, which I'll, I'll start to respond to. Um, uh, for all of you, but if you've got any questions, please, please um, submit them. Uh, and the answer, the, the, the question I can see in front of me at the moment is um, uh, someone's asking, in the distance learning approach, as mentioned, it says the video focuses on the key parts and then the workbook goes into everything in detail. In your opinion, does the video contain the info that you have found the questions tend to focus on or is it solely just an overview? Ooh. Um, a difficult. I, I, I mean, it's a, it's a great question, um, and I understand the question. The question, your your questions, effectively, um, and I understand exactly. I don't, please don't feel that I'm being dismissive when I say this. But the question is effectively saying, is there a shortcut to this? Yeah. Um, honestly, um, you know, to an extent, there is. You know, clearly, if you. Uh, watch the video, if you distill what's in the video, if you test yourself on the 10 questions at the end of the chapter and you find your answer in all 10 correctly, uh, if you get to the revision section and you find you're comfortably uh, achieving passes and you're learning from those things you get wrong, then actually uh, spending a heck of a lot of time reading the workbook might have been unnecessary. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tell you that you should be reading the workbook. And if I didn't tell you that reading the workbook uh, will potentially be the differentiator in terms of success and failure. Uh, but I also appreciate that reading the workbook is a hardship. It is not a bundle of laughs. Yeah? Um, and I do have some sympathy with the question being asked. And I think if you do, uh, take on board all the things that I've said. In other words, if you've watched the video diligently, you've learned from it, you've tested yourselves in terms of questions, uh, you've got confidence and you've used this virtuous circle approach, then the workbook's importance does to an extent diminish. Yeah. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Now I hope that's answered the question. Any other questions? Feel free to submit. If not, I think we're done. I, I really hope that was useful. I hope you learned from it. Um, if I um, click forward uh, one more slide, I think you'll find, if I can get there in the end, um, uh, you'll find there that uh, we've got a big tick on the slide, which is illustrating that we're there at the end. Um, uh, there's my details again. Feel free to email me. Feel free to link in with me and, and the like. Um, I, it's always lovely. Uh, this is my life. I like getting involved in this stuff. So don't hesitate to contact me. Reach out if you feel I can help at all. Um, our website is there. Obviously, all of our products and other details are provided on our, our website. If you want to know anything more about it, like prices and things. Uh, our distance learning option very very reasonably priced yeah especially when you compare it to the cost of sitting in the exam um, so well well worthwhile and in my belief it is fantastic um, but I would say that wouldn't I I, I hope some of you agree um, but I believe it's fantastic and we'll do the job for you so I, I really hope that's been useful um, so I'll say goodbye and let you get on with your day thank you ever so much for your time uh, I'm Martin from the Tudor team at the CCL Academy Thanks ever so much and bye for now.